management's uh, information meeting uh, for the uh, call for information and nominations and notice of an intent to prepare an environmental assessment for offshore wind off the Massachusetts and federal waters. So thank you all for coming this afternoon. And sorry we had a, a delay, uh, from, but our court reporter has uh, gotten everything together and uh, so we're moving right along. Um, I'm Maurice Hill, and I'm with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. I actually work in the Pacific region out in California, and I'm a renewable energy uh, program coordinator out there, and I'll be facilitating uh, the meeting today. So what my job is, is to make sure that uh, each one of you who has signed up to speak to us today has an opportunity. Uh, we have several people who fill out forms, and there's at least a dozen folks that, that have. So uh, each of you will uh, speak in the order that you signed in. And if there is time, uh, we will also have an opportunity for uh, you to ask uh, questions and we'll get answers from our panel. Um, basically, our agenda today is that there will be a, a, a presentation uh, by the Bureau and uh, we'll go through uh, what is being proposed and what, what we are doing. And uh, at that point, we'll ask the speakers to uh, give their comments and information to the panel. So I would like to introduce um, our, our host from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Bill uh, White, and his Assistant Secretary for Energy and Environmental Affairs. Thank you, Maurice. Um, thanks all for coming out, uh, particularly on Valentine's Day. I see a little bit of red in the audience. The rest of you are in trouble. Um, so my name is Bill White. I work at, uh, upstairs at the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. So on behalf of Governor Patrick and, um, and my boss, Secretary Rick Sullivan, um, we are uh, thrilled to kind of uh, be your host today and welcome our federal friends that uh, we have been uh, working with for really since, I think, uh, September of 2009. At least that's when we officially uh, consummated our relationship with our first public outreach. Uh, I also want to recognize Bruce Carlisle. Most, many of you know he directs our coastal zone management office. So Bruce and I have kind of been the uh, state side team kind of shepherding the process uh, over the last almost two and a half years. So um, very briefly, uh, obviously we're here to talk about offshore wind and its uh, tremendous potential for Massachusetts. Uh, the state of Massachusetts believes that we could potentially uh, generate enough clean electricity in that area to basically uh, provide electricity for 1.7 million homes. And to give you some context, that's about 70% of all the homes in Massachusetts. It's preliminary to kind of talk about exactly all the details because the technology is changing, but that is our initial uh, take. I also want to say that um, clean energy is a, is a big priority for the governor. Um, as, as many of you know, and many of you have been a part of uh, Massachusetts, uh, through the governor's leadership, we have the highest greenhouse gas emissions reduction target in the country, uh, 25% below 1990 levels by 2020. Uh, we have a huge uh, energy efficiency focus. Uh, we've just recognized as the number one country, in the, the number one state in the country on energy efficiency as far as our level of investment and our, and our focus on that. Uh, we have solar uh, initiative, and we're also working on wind, both onshore and offshore. The governor has set a goal of uh, 2,000 megawatts of wind, uh, of which we think 75% by 2020 will come offshore. So it's a tre tremendous resource. Uh, Massachusetts is not the only state uh, in the, in the, on the East Coast working on this, and our federal friends will talk a little bit about that, but we're, we're basically part of a process that's happening all the way down the coast, uh, from North Carolina up to Maine. So uh, one of the final things I wanted to mention is what we're doing here is we're trying to bring all the different voices and all the different uh, stakeholders and all the different users of, of the marine environment. We're trying to bring you all to the table and try to basically have a process where we can get all of our voices to the table and inform the, the federal process. We are doing that through a formal process that uh, Mari will talk about. It's called a, a task force, and it's intergovernmental task force. So we have elected officials from all the island uh, towns. We have uh, county commissioners, state legislators, 
we have tribal leaders, we have, um, I'm missing people, but we have the state uh, represented at the table, we have all the federal officials, we have our congressional delegation, so we have a formal process going on. We've had about nine meetings. They started again back in uh, fall of 2009, where we had a, a much larger planning area. Um, we've also created additional stakeholder meetings. We've had a lot of public meetings like this. We spent a lot of time in the vineyard, obviously. We spent a lot of time in Boston, spent a lot of time in New Bedford. We created a, a fisheries working group, uh, so we can kind of dive a little bit deeper on the issues of the, of the fishing community, which is uh, near and dear to uh, our governor's heart. And then we also created a fisheries working group. And we have basically some of the best um, brains in Massachusetts, uh, a number of organizations at the table kind of giving us advice, giving us input, telling us a little bit about what it was. What did I call it? Fishery foot. All right, it's a habitat working group. I just want to make sure Bruce is paying attention. So to wrap up, uh, through all these processes so far, and again, this is kind of a, a developing process, this original planning area was about twice the size. It was a little bit further north, but after an enormous amount of input that we've gotten, this is really where we are right now, and this is the purpose of today's meeting. It's called a call, uh, the defense of this issue, a call for information. So they're really interested in stakeholder uh, and developer interest in this area to see if uh, offshore wind can be part of Massachusetts' future. So without further ado, I am going to turn it back to Maurice. Okay, so. Um, as we mentioned, uh, we do have a court reporter, Aida Correa. She is here taking uh, a record of everything that was said, so we're capturing all of your input today. So um, be assured that we, we do have that record. Uh, just a few logistics. Um, uh, we do have maps. Uh, Bill pointed out the maps for the areas that we're discussing here. We also have some maps in the back, so feel free to uh, take a look at those uh, as, as the proceedings go today. Uh, the restrooms, restrooms are important, and they are straight down the hall, so you go out the door right here, make a left, pass the water fountain, the drinking fountains that are on your right. Uh, there is an exit here, of course, and there's an exit in the rear. Uh, so, I would like to introduce our panel at this point, your Ocean Energy Management Panel. And first is uh, Maureen Bordenhall. And Maureen is our uh, program manager for the Office of Renewable Energy. And uh, she will be leading uh, the sessions today. Uh, this is Jessica Bradley. Jessica is the uh, project coordinator uh, for Massachusetts. Uh, Tim Redding, next, is our senior policy uh, analyst. And finally, but not least of all, is uh, Brian Crever, who is our NEPA coordinator for Massachusetts. Uh, so we will be giving, uh, Maureen will be giving a presentation next, and uh, I should say that the presentation is going to be uh, posted on our website, so uh, you can take notes of course today, but uh, uh, feel sure that the uh, detailed slides will be posted on the web. So, Maureen. Thank you all for spending the afternoon with us, and I am really excited to be talking about how we're making progress and working together, developing a network, and making progress in identifying potentially an area that we could eventually offer for leasing for commercial uh, wind. We are now the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. I think the last time we were here, you added a re re uh, regulations and enforcement onto the end of that, and we gone through our, our October uh, transition to this new agency, and we more of Tommy Bojo, our director in this area, so we're excited about that. Less about seeing me and more about seeing him as a good person. Okay, as, as Bill and Maurice mentioned, we're here to talk about the call for information uh, and nominations, the call, and the notice of intent to prepare an environmental assessment, or an NOI. We publish both of those documents on the 6th of February, and they each have a 45-day comment period. So what we wanted to do today was talk to you a little bit about um, what our expectation is associated with uh, receiving the comments from you, as well as talk a little bit about um, reminding you as to what the process is, how that information will be incorporated to that process, and what the next steps are. After all, I am a bureaucrat, and it is about the process, but also it's about the dialogue, and I hope that after folks have their opportunity 
to present their concerns, issues, and information to us formally, that we'll be able to have a Q&A session and just kind of ask questions and do the fun part about this meeting, which will be the dialogue. So anyway, getting back to the call and the NOI, we have a 45-day comment period. That closes on March 22nd. And there are various ways that you can submit comments uh, to us, and we'll get to that at the end of the presentation. So what is a call? We saw that it was reported in one of the local papers that, oh goodness, there's this lease going to be issued, and there's going to be this huge wind, huge wind farm, and that's what the announcement last week was about. No, that's not what the announcement was about. What the call for information and nominations is, it's not a decision to lease. What it is, is it's taking that information that we've uh, developed with the Intergovernmental Task Force, with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the two working groups that the state has set up, the dialogue with you all as stakeholders. I guess we've been up here over two dozen times, excuse me, over a dozen times with um, interaction with stakeholders. And we mush that and develop that into an RFI area. We receive comments from the request for interest or RFI, and we've, as Bill mentioned, we, we've reduced that to uh, about a, a 54% of what, well, we reduced by half. So about 50% of where it was. And now this is the next time this requirement we want to go out and ask questions about, are, is there still industry, industry interest in the area? What are the other questions, issues, concerns, information about this call area? So then we can take that and develop the next step, which will be area identification, as well as develop what the proposed action will be that will be analyzed under the National Environmental Policy. So a call merely is another step in the planning and analysis stage. We're not at stage two yet, the leasing stage. Stage one, planning and analysis. Basically, it's engaging you all as stakeholders and our intergovernmental task force as well as the public in this dialogue to upload information. Because we all know this is a new energy area. It's a new energy technology. There has not been a lot of catalysts for it in information development. And so we want to take this opportunity to use information that is out there available that you all have to be able to help us inform our decisions and make for a robust environmental analysis document. So we are publishing this call and the NOI. That's where we are in the process. We're going to consider that information, as I mentioned, develop this area identification or the proposed action in the NEPA process. That area identification will turn into something that our secretary calls a wind energy area. And we have, we brought a map um, that shows kind of the other planning we're doing on the East Coast that, that Bill mentioned. And we do have four other wind energy areas in the Mid-Atlantic here. So that's what we're trying, we're moving towards, we believe, up here in Massachusetts. What we will do after we identify a wind energy area or area identification is then go through the process and evaluate the implications to the human, marine, and coastal environment from site assessment and site characterization activities. And again, we'll talk a little bit about that later. The second stage is leasing. So we even haven't moved to leasing yet, because we have not completed our environmental assessment. So anyway, leasing, we can offer access to the area that is the um, federal outer continental shelf, which extends beyond three miles off of state lands, one of two ways. Through a competition, if there is overlapping interest in the call area, or the area that we would call the area identification, or we can do this in a non-competitive method if there doesn't appear to be that overlapping interest. How will we know about overlapping interest? Well, the request for information that was published a while back, that kind of gave us an indication there was a lot of industry interest that overlapped one another. And the call for information nomination, the responses we received from industry from, from that notice, will also help us define what areas are we going to expose to competitive leasing, and are there any areas that we would have a non-competitive lease negotiation process. So that is important for us. Uh, with regard to the information we will use in response to this call. In the leasing stage, we don't stop talking to the public. We don't stop doing these public information meetings hosted by the, the Commonwealth. We are going to continue to work with the public and stakeholders and our intergovernmental task forces. Because again, this is a new process, this is a new energy sector, in the frontier area, we want to continue that dialogue because we know what we don't know, and we know that you all have uh, really good resources at your fingertips to help make our decision making more robust. We will also publish other notices. Again, we're the federal government. We love our process. 
But if we go forward with a non-competitive process, the next notice you're going to see after we inform you of the area identification will be this determination of no competitive interest notice. If we, after taking a look at the information we receive from industry, from the call for information nomination, determine it appears to be competition, after we inform you of the area identification, the notice you'll see is this proposed sale notice that will be followed by a final sale notice and eventually a lease sale. So we still have a, some um, process ahead of us, but the there'll be that opportunity for public input at those formal stages, as well as our ongoing dialogue with you uh, informally. This is important to note. One of the other uh, announcements that was made earlier this month was the announcement about a commercial lease plan. And what we agreed to do in our regulatory framework that went final in uh, April of 2009 was that we would publish a template that we would use for commercial leasing for our interim policy leases and a Cape Wind lease, we generated original leases. But that is not necessarily the most efficient manner to be able to issue leases, and we wanted to have public input on the, developing the template for that lease. So basically, that lease now is final. There is a template that we'll use for all commercial leases, whether issued competitively or not competitively. And that lease that will be issued does not convey to a developer the right to immediately construct. So if I win a lease in a lease sale, it doesn't mean the next day I can go ahead and construct. There is a process that will be engaged in in which they have to submit plans for approval and environmental review before they actually get to uh, develop, construct, and generate. 